Let us explore this with another deep dive much deeper. John defines Muhammad's Christ in an elegant way. There is God alone and then there is the human Jesus who carries the word of God and God's spirit. Jesus is begotten from Mary, Miriam, sister of Moses and Aaron. I have explored the Jewish chains of Miriam's in the paper, The Genius of Miriam, revealing her role as a transcendent symbol of temple and covenant, not unlike the role of Muhammad as the Mahdi. Miriam, as a descendant of Imram, is equally important as the David, as a descendant of Imram, for our understanding. The concept is Talmudic Jewish. Babylonians need three messianic elements. The temple, the Davidic king, and the high priest as the spiritual supreme leader. Miriam is a symbol for the annunciation of the saviour in the temple in the house of God. Her lineage is an element in the supreme leadership of the Sanhedrin, which is made up of branches of Moses, Aaron and Miriam. And we have here a reference from the Talmud. The vine is the Torah. The three branches are Moses, Aaron and Miriam. And we see also the vine is Jerusalem. The three branches are the temple, the king and the high priest. The successors of Herod the Great come through Miriam, as well as the royal lineages of Joseph from Egypt and David from Babylon. So we're going to kind of go take a deep dive into this Herodian connection. At the turn to the first century BC, Judah Aristobulus I was the first Hasmonean king of Judea. 104 to 103 BC. He was son of John Hieracinus. Aristobulus ushered in the only short period of less than a century that primary evidence attests Jewish rule over Jerusalem. It was not a peaceful era. Let me rephrase that. The soil was red. Other than Herod, the last of the Hasmonean was Aristobulus II. By having Aristobulus killed, his sister and Herod's wife, uh, Mariam, uh, Miriam Mary, was the only one left with competing Hasmonean royal lineage. It creates a genetic bottleneck through which the top Jewish and Muslim Hashim leadership comes. This killing robs the branch through Aristobulus of their lineage primacy and puts Herod as first and only one in line. It makes him Herod the slave, meaning the undisputed supreme leader. The Pharisees, i.e. the Pharisees and Persian Pharisees, hated it. Two important clans spring from her, one through Herod the son Alexander I and the other through Aristobulus IV to the Agrippus. And so we have from the Talmud, You are neither a Rekha nor the son of a Rekha, but Herod the slave who has made himself a freed man. So that's the reference to Herod the slave. What is the meaning of Rekha? It means royalty. Now let's move on. Alexander's offspring includes kings of Armenia, rulers over Asia, and Praetorian prefects over Egypt. Been married to King Archelaus of Cappadocia's daughter, uh, Glaphira, the Herodians were able to extend their influence into Anatolia. She was a Macedonian royal descendant and of maternal Persian royal descent. A challenge to her, it appears to have led to Alexander's termination and her being returned to Cappadocia. Her sons, Tigranes V of Armenia, and Alexander II, Prince of Judea, allegedly renounced Judaism when Herod died. Tigranes was appointed king of Armenia by Emperor Augustus, making Artaxta his capital. Since he died childless, his renunciation is of no consequence. Little is known about her other son, Alexander II, Prince of Judea, other than that he became 
administrator of estates in Egypt for their Roman imperial family. Josephus tells us that Herod's grandson Agrippa was looked at as a god. So I've, I've dropped in here now the appendix uh, from the paper, Appendix E, and it gives us an overview of the Hasmonean family tree to Herod the Great and Miriam the First. So you can see at the very bottom of it, Herod the Great married to Miriam. Um, we can see that it goes via Matthias from 166 BC through Simon Maccabeus, the high priest, through John Her the I to Alexander uh, Yanius to Her Hyrcanus II and um, uh, Antipater the Edomain, Herod the Great, and then via uh, Aristobulus II through Alexander to Mariam. Okay, so that was a really powerful uh, family tree there. So AJ Juice goes on to say that the latter's daughter, Berenice, married Marcus Julius Alexander, son of the Jewish Alexander the uh, Alabarch, with no known ancestry, as though we are not able to recognise that the Herodian Alexander II is the same person. While this may lack direct primary evidence, uh, Berenice carried the royal spirit of Miriam, and the evidence in Herod's family tree shows that they preferred closely related marriages. I suppose that marriages among the living ancestral relations may have been a simple mechanism to protect them from lineage pretenders. If she were betrothed to just any rich schmuck, the succession of the divine presence would die out. The Allah Bark was the highest Jewish authority in Egypt, head of customs and chief tax collector in Roman Egypt. Berenice's husband's brother, Tiberius Julius, was Roman Emperor Titus II in command in the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD and Praetorian Prefect of Egypt. Not quite emperor, but not far off. Food for thought. This same Tiberius Julius Alexander appears in the timeline of anti-Semitism as the one under whose command 50,000 Jews were killed during the uh, Alexandria riot. Infants, women and the infirm were slaughtered by the Romans, inverted commas, with no regard, and their houses burned down. The minor detail that Tiberius Julius was the Jewish Nazi happens to be left out. This was an inner Jewish sectarian civil war. The episode tells us that one Jewish group was aligned with the Emperor Titus and the other with Emperor Nero, who is not only considered a Jewish proselyte but also the father of the sage Rabbi Meir who shows up next to Rabbi Akifa and Simon Bar Kokhba during the Bar Kokhba rev uh, revolt another major anti-semitic event that is not so Jews against Jews does not equal anti-semitism so this is quite a revelation here um, something I hadn't heard of before Without insinuating any connection to the otherwise vague Herodian ancestry, there is a pretext to the Jewish post in Egypt. During the late Roman Republic, tax farming was contracted out to the Publicanus, who would be responsible over entire provinces. It was a corrupt extortion mechanism similar to the one already described. The Equites would conduct their mission as armed knights, as we could imagine. Where this might have led can be exemplified with the Roman banker Gaius uh, Rabirius uh, Postumus, what a name, who was charged of extortion in Egypt but acquitted on a legal technicality. He had financed Ptolemy the, the 12th uh, Olites restoration to power in Egypt. As collateral, he was given the tax collection for all of Egypt. To that avail, he became uh, Dio Iketes, finance minister of Egypt. The system appears to have served one purpose, maintaining total control by a few families of the one percenters over everybody else. The Rabiri family was prominent enough to find many entries on 
inscriptions, they are worthy of a closer look, not least since they would later show up in our bond, a place in our spotlight. It could not get any more corrupt. Add to this that the Herodian Berenice became Titus's lover after her husband died and moved to Rome. Never mind that the stories reek no less than Islamic tradition. However, the severing of Bernice's lineage from Egypt's Alabarque is not decisive. More relevant is that another one of Agrippa's daughters was betrothed to Demetrius of Alexandria, who was the Jewish Alabarque and obviously in the lineage of Alexander the Alabarque. True her forms the Hasmonean Sadducee hybrid master lineage that goes through the Marzutrans to Islam's Muhammad and the Hashemites. What a connection. Of all the names that could have been chosen for the girl without history, she was named Mariam, like her Hasmonean great-grandmother. That makes her the most important mother of fathers during her time, a Mary Miriam in the Islamic chain of Miriams. Our imagination of what plot we are in is too narrow. It is a miracle that historians are not all over the factual issue that Nero and Titus clash at Jerusalem and that this very event ushers in a new Roman dynasty which was supported by the Alabarque line in Alexandria. While it is not consensus and lineage details of the Alabarques are missing, it is neither quantum computing nor completely invisible, so much so that putting Alexander and Alexander together is the only major issue in this Herodian section that is not readily available in the historical literature. Now, <clears throat> some coinage here to, to whet our appetite. Herod Agrippa reigned in Judea from 41 to 44 AD. His brother was Herod of Calchus, who ruled a territory north of Judea. On a coin, both brothers crown Emperor Claudius. On the obverse, the coin says, King Herod, King Agrippa Claudius Augustus Caesar. On the reverse, we get clarity about who is being crowned. It reads, for Claudius Caesar Augustus, year three. While this is extremely confusing, it does not appear to raise eyebrows about what kind of Game of Thrones was being played by an insignificant minority. Nobody seems to be able or willing to make sense of it. It is perhaps a prank that the Agrippa clan obviously supported the outgoing Julio-Claudian Roman dynasty that ends with Emperor Nero. Supporting is an incorrect word choice in the presence of visual primary evidence that Jewish leaders crowned Emperor Claudius. The Herod of Calchus on the coin just so happens to also have been married to Amerium, daughter of Olympias, herself daughter of Herod, and a Samaritan woman without history by the name of Maltes, as though she was just any woman. This no man's girl sits at the helm of Herodian kings in minor Armenia and parts of greater Armenia. The Samaritan influence shows in her offspring. There is an entire Miriam swarm around the Herodians, one of which was the daughter of the high priest, Simon Botus, whose family originated in Alexandria. Her son, Herod Botus, was removed from the Herodian line of succession as though that could ever have gone well. Their daughter, Salome, is prominent in the New Testament as the one asking for the head of John the Baptist. Salome married Aristopolis of Chalcis, son of the guy on the coin, which made her queen of Armenia minor. So you can see the, the family tree there on the right. And then we ought to be surprised that the temple goes up in flames, an event sold as anti-Semitism. I promise to get to the point. Yes, it is a bit of a long journey to the the reason why the, the power went from the Umaids to the Abbasid, but he'll get there. For the big picture, we need to have an understanding that Jewish leaders appear to not only have been good at subverting other people's governments, but also their own sectarian rulers. A couple of hundred thousand corpses matter not, but 
There is no lineage that can pass by Herod the Great. Two lineages are of importance, Agrippa and Alexander the Prince. Alexander's lineage not only made it big in Egypt, but also in Rome. One of them made it to become Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the College of Pontiffs in Rome. No other position in the Roman religion is more powerful other than the emperor himself. In fact, since Emperor Augustus, the Pontifex Maximus was the emperor. And there's the evidence. No, I'm not going to answer the question in this paper other than stating that it is impossible that there was no Jewish emperor in all of history. Jews were smarter than everybody else. They did not abolish Judaism, of which we do not know much about, as researchers insist on every step along the way as though they could have known, and just as Jews would not rather die than eat pork, so we are told they did not care as long as they were the leaders. Judaism guaranteed them royal connections at the very top. They simply doubled their loyalties and decided to steer from within while quietly continuing to read the Torah. It is the royal lineage that matters, not the religion that they subvert to lead. How can they forget their religion knowing to be Herodians? The next of Cain rules. Yet the penetration of Jewish leaders in the highest echelons is astonishing and admirable. After all, for someone with Jewish Hasmonean blood to become the Pontifex Maximus in Rome between the Second Jewish-Roman War and the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt in Jerusalem, is an extraordinary achievement certainly none of them would have wished to advertise jewishness indeed subverting the roman religion was such a genius move that it would never occur to us with their hasmonean hashemite lineage they decided to play the deceiver from the house of joseph their hermolius the wolf literally in the figurative sense we can see as much with our own eyes, for example, in synagogues with mosaics depicting Saul Invictus. We just could not wrap our heads around its meaning. Another from the Alexander lineage, Gaius uh, Vidius Cassius, was given the imperium over the entire east of the Roman Empire. In 175 AD, he declared himself emperor, as though that should have come as a surprise. The ambitions are total and it is merely the beginning, if even. They never got over their grandeur. The problem is not that leaders of an insignificant minority try and come up on top. It is their willingness to push everyone else under the ground for their end and to pretend that they were never there. This is not about the Jewish people. They are victims all the same. This is about identifiable Jewish leaders from two or more branches of the same root with a very aggressive biblical mindset. It comes up here because we cannot understand how the role of Jewish leaders is even possible in the rise of Islam without grasping the intent of this specific Jewish leadership. Those who want to fight anti-Semitism, of whom I have counted myself for decades, must begin with a very inconvenient past. They operated a religio-political cartel that made its decisions through assemblies, the Sanhedrin. The ambitions were and are totalitarian. One of Herod's sons, the Tetrarch Ar- Archelaus, was relocated to Vienne, France, in around 40 AD. The son of the godlike Agrippa was whisked from Jerusalem at the beginning of the First Jewish Roman War. He was under the protection of Emperor Claudius, and the latter may have moved Agrippa's family to Cologne in Germany. Cologne's original name was CCAA, Colonia Claudia Ara Agrippensium, as evidenced in the inscription on the side portal of the Roman north gate of the city. The Agrippensians are also mentioned by Tacitus in the early 2nd century. They established settlements along the Rhine River, for example, in Warden today's Netherlands, where a 2nd century uh, El Gabal inscription was discovered, a text that reveals the likely worship of the Chaldean god Jubal, meaning god of the black stone. 
how this fits together will be told at another future deep dive but this god is associated with Akkad, Old Babylon and Ur. Herodians were still found in 8th century Cologne and maintained there a strong community through to modern times. After the first Jewish Roman war Jews were mass deported we are told and many were also resettled to French Lyon, Arles and Bordeaux and Narbonne Incense, modern day province region in southern France, of which Narbonne was a city. There are some of the references. Narbonne. Long before our events in the focus of this paper, Jewish leaders were already there. With good conscience, and because religious beliefs are extraordinarily persistent and slow moving, we can take it as fact that some Jews still looked for Christ in Herod Agrippa in the 8th century for about as long as Christians had looked for Christ in Jesus. The Sephardi Maimonides begged then that the first of two messiahs should come to save Israel from the hand of the children of Esau. These are but the Herodians and the belief was still persistent with 19th century Tehran and Persian Jewry. The Herodians are also responsible for Edom being equated with Rome, for reasons that the previous paragraphs should sufficiently illuminate, albeit with candlelight. The Hasmoneans, a.k.a. the proto-Islamic Banu Hashem, a.k.a. Hasidic Jews, had to assimilate the Herodian bloodline. There was no other royal lineage. We should not be surprised that Prophet Muhammad is coming up through this branch. Instead, we should be surprised were it any other branch but Hashem. Yet the royal priesthood constitutes the leadership over all ten tribes of Judaism and thus over the entire diaspora. Hence a messianic head can pop up whenever and wherever as long as it is with royal blood. That can only be Herodians who pop up in pre and proto Islam as Marzutrans. A Christian would perhaps understand John's remark about the Herodian dignity of the Christ in the same way as the Nazarene's confession that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. John connects but these two Jewish groups to the Son of God, none other. If taken as contemporary then, the Quran also speaks of but two distinct groups that venerate the Son of God. One group are the Nasara, popularly and prematurely taken as Christians. One can accept the Son of God without being a Christian by rejecting his crucifixion and resurrection. Even though John also classifies them as a Christian heresy, he identifies them as Jews who just so happen to have accepted the Son of God. The other group are the Yahud, prematurely taken as generalized Jews. They venerate Uzer as a Son of God, as the Quran adds, that these beliefs resemble old ones. Surah 2 clarifies that the people of the book say that none but Jews or Christians shall enter paradise. Rejecting each other's beliefs, neither a Jew nor a Christian in our modern understanding would say such a thing. For Christians, the only way to heaven is through Jesus, the Son of God. For them, Jews and Muslims or anybody else have no path. Just two verses down, the Surah states that the Jews say the christians lean on naught on naught lean the jews say the christians yet both are readers of the book four groups are at play people of the book hudan nasara and yahud the latter two reject each other but for that both can still be jewish sectarians and that is made clear in surah 5 where the quran accepts the covenant of those who say we are christians Since the Quran appears to embrace the entirety of the Nasara sect, not just a subgroup of them, it included them as believers in the Son of God, which moves them very close to being Christians, but still recognised by John of Damascus as Jews. Thus the Quran continues to say that they too have forgotten a part of what they were taught, wherefore we have stirred up enmity and hatred amongst them. The big enmity in the historical record of the 7th century is between Byzantine Christianity, Egyptian Monophysite Christianity and the Jewish Saracen Ishmaelites who may have been forced to accept Jesus as Son of God under Husro's watch 
and may have also assimilated the Melkite uh, Gasnid Saracens, and thus internalised the brewing conflict. Husro ultimately drove them from the temple after the events in 614-617 AD, but we do not know how far the forced conversions penetrated the Ishmaelites. The Quran reverses that process and deals with four Jewish groups of which, at a minimum, the Nasara accepted Jesus as the Son of God and the Yahud accepted Uzer as the Son of God. Surah 4 warns the people of the book not to overstep their boundaries and in the same breath clarifies that they either are Trinitarians or perhaps in danger to accept such beliefs. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Miriam, is only an apostle of God and his word which he conveyed into Mary, Miriam, and a spirit proceeding from himself. Believe therefore in God and his apostles and say not three, forbear, it will be better for you. The Quran explains that Jesus is not a son of God but a human son of Miriam, even though it acknowledges that he is the Messiah and that the word of God, the Holy Spirit, was implanted into Miriam and that the Spirit, the Word of God, comes from Jesus himself. He is the Word of God. Today the Quran is made to believe that it rejects any divinity on a human being. However, the Shia concept of the Mahdi is omnipresent in Iran and Afghanistan, picture Miriam's role that transcends space and time like a Mahdi. Humans are deprived of such feats. In 19th century Persia, a Jewish missionary who believed in Jesus reported that Syed Abbas sat at Kermanshah as God Ali. They believed in the incarnation of God in Ali just as much as the arch Shiites did. We cannot dismiss the reality of intercessor gods for Jews or Muslims because it does not fit preconceptions of what Islam is supposed to be when Islam had not yet become what it was not designed to be, and because we have no idea what Judaism and its sectarians look like. The contemporary reference in John of Damascus to two groups that venerate the Son of God is hardly a coincidence, and it is not random that he mentions Herod, but not Uzer. The Nazara is identical without further ado. In Arabic, Uzer is Uzer, as you can see, but if it was marked incorrectly, and as we saw in our live stream recently, AJ is clearly making a point by spelling this incorrectly, um, it can read Aziz, meaning beloved, holy, or praised, which is a familiar term used in context in the appearance of the Messianic Mahmed. The Herodian clan of the Mohammedan chain appears to carry a similar meaning, at least since Joseph du Nuwas's 6th century inscription in Yemen, where we have the praise one, or um, as you can see, Mahmed there. Now we have Uzair's story in Surah Baqarah, supposedly. And that's it there. Uh, Quranic exegetes agree that the, the person who wonders how God resurrects the dead is Uzer. And we also find here, of course, Jews today will probably deny that they say Uzer or Ezra is the son of God. However, there definitely were a group of Jews at the time of Prophet Muhammad who, said, who used to say Uzer is the son of God. This is uh, an Islamic uh, website here that I'm quoting the, the slide and the previous one, just in case you're confused. Um, but if you look at this here, you can see that the that the Arabic here is Uzer, but it's translated as Ezra, which is not correct. Um, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, while the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. Confusingly, the Quran would therefore go against Muhammad. It does not. It goes against those who wanted to see Muhammad and his kin as sons of God. If we were to build a straight line from the beliefs in Ali's incarnation as God to the Herodian son of God, then the Quran boils down to a rejection of the Yahud faith framework 
in the house of Ali. But because of the intermixture of sources in the Quran, there is no consistency. It will be sorted out, just not here. Now we know where to look and can start putting more puzzle stones down. The Yahudu are not unspecified Jews, but Jews from Yahudia in Isfahan, i.e. Persians. They are the Marzutran descendants of Abdullah ibn al-Zubair, a.k.a. Exilarch Heman I, a.k.a. Ali. So according to A.J. Juice, Ali is the Jewish Exilarch Heman. Now, it's interesting there. I'm of the opinion that Uthman and Heman are the same person. And, and it's interesting that um, Leo says that one of the writers of the Quran is Ali. But in Islamic tradition, they say it is Uthman who basically brings the Quran together. So um, if Ali and Heman and Uthman are one and the same person, that could actually make a lot of sense. Now, um, uh, AJ Juice doesn't consider the XLR Heman to be Uthman. But if you look at the Latin version of Uthman, it's, it's spelled E-T and then H-E-M-A-N. So all this, it, all we have to do to bring it from the Latin for Uthman is to add E-T to He-Man, and you've got it, you know. Um, <clears throat> so to go on from there, they have strong ties to Yemen through the Marzutran lineage of Joseph du Nuwas that comes back together with Salman al-Farisi's wife through Ethiopia, where du Nuwas' wife had before been brought. We can make such leaps because we are dealing with the leadership of a small minority, which royal succession mechanism is limited to only a handful of people who diligently guard their bloodline. While they could be part of the umbrella people of the book, they are neither Nasara nor Sabaeans nor Hudan. The Mayusa in the Quran are the Pharisee Jews from Mahosa, essentially Mesopotamian Persians from a Sassanid perspective. The Ashraku or Mushrikin in the Quran are the Eastern Jews, Syria, located around the Sibis, Nahardia, and Pompadita. We must bear in mind that Jews live in the diaspora. There is no local adherence over and above perhaps their headquarters and even that moves depending on the political situation. Typically Jewish sectarians can be found anywhere on the populated parts of this planet. This is why we cannot connect the dots when we focus on regional history or on narrow eras. It needs the world view of the diaspora to start grasping it. The Levite layers are even harder to pin down even though they appear to be limited to the Marzutran lineage for Proto-Islam. They penetrate all Jewish tribes as the spiritual leaders and governmental enforcers. They are the ones who engineer religious divisions, even while they all adhere to the religious council. Ordinary Jews and Muslims are brothers in Herodian Marzutran victims. We have already learned about the Jewish chain of Muhammad's now we can reduce it to the Jewish Marzutran chain of Muhammad's. All caliphs are Muhammad's. All caliphs are Marzutran Jews, albeit not always from the same branch. All caliphs must therefore be Herodians. The inner Marzutran fights over which branch should constitute the spiritual supreme leader defines proto-Islam and its conflicts. Their story is the story of Islam from its seed deep into the Abbasid and Ottoman eras. Now that we have the Jewish partners of the Quran, this is why John of Damascus' current status of his work does not earn our trust about the Ishmaelites. Why does he not say that they are partners in the Quran and partners with the Ishmaelites? He leaves out that they just so happen to be at one another's throats while being in bed with each other. If it is from his pen, he must have had a sword down his neck. 
or it has not happened yet, at least not the way we have been convinced it happened. A few years after John had written The Fount of Knowledge, Peter, Bishop of Meuma in the Gaza, received a death sentence for calling Muhammad a false prophet and the forerunner of the Antichrist. It seems that John's wording would have been acceptable by a Saracen leader and insulting to someone else. Something fundamental must have changed. That's a very significant point there. Pat to Baghdad. From the old book of Tang, we can learn that China was involved in the conflicts with Arab rulers. The Tang settled Peroz, the last ruler of the Sassanid Empire, in modern-day Karanj, Afghanistan. Karanj is a mysterious place, but his presence there might explain why the south-eastern portion of Iran is seemingly untouched by orientations towards Baghdad, Nirban and Girona, as inadmissible as this line of reasoning is. These sources tell us that the Sassanids, as Po Shi, still held on to territory. The Chinese annals see an inner Persian affair, but they are spiked with such symbolic language that I long view them with hesitation, not least because they are late from the turn to the 9th century and because professional translators appear to think that they are not worth their time. In an unmistaken allusion to the forerunner John the Baptist, there was a Persian camel leader at a mountain called Jufen Modina, or Kuhon Medina. Since Medina means city, and Medina in the Arab Peninsula was then called Yatrib, the city Jufen, or Kuhun is unclear. An evident representative of the House of David, a line man, pointed to a weapons cache in a cave of the mountain. A black stone was also there with instructions on how to take down the Sassanid dynasty. The Persian camel herder then established a separatist kingdom in the western part of the Sassanid Empire. Let us try to ignore tradition and reflect on what happened during the years of the Dayi era, 605 to 618 AD, in the west of the Persian Empire. By placing this date range next to the most significant event in Judaism at the time, no speculation is needed to unravel the entire Islamic house of cards. 605 to 618 AD and 614 to 617 AD. This is when the Jewish Marzutran exilarch Nehemiah ben Huziel and Benjamin of Tiberias sat on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The two played, of course, the forerunner and David. Hence the cave is under the foundation stone and the black stone is it. An entry in the Chinese source from around the 650s contends that the separatist Taiyi state had existed since 617 AD and they made themselves kings according to a Moshu ranking. Other than the entire affair being presented as Persian, it also reflects a Rashidun Shiite view. When the original king had died, his office passed to the first Moshu, and now the king was the third Moshu. The royal surname is Tushi. The original king is not the first king. When we hear the only thing every Shiite can recite from memory without fail, it is their list of caliphs. It is curious that their original king, Muhammad of the tradition, is not the first king either. At the time the entry was recorded, the third king was in place and his name was Kanmimo Moni, viewed as a fighter who worshipped a celestial god. This is not helpful because it likely refers to a title, Kangmi al Mominan, Prince or Commander of the Believers, and might reflect a late 8th century perspective. It was likely Uthman, aka Salman al Farisi, uh, must therefore have been a Persian Pharisee while being Zoroastrian at that time. That part I'm not 100% sure if 
if I go along with um, AJ Juice's um, determining that Uthman and Salman al Farsi are one and the same person. But nonetheless, being the third king implies that Abu Bakr, aka Jacob, aka Hermelos, was the first, and that the year 617 AD was already symbolic for them, and they were feeding it to the Chinese, but it was not yet the new Muslim year 622 AD. They do not seem to know about a new religion of Islam, and praying to a celestial god might as well refer to Zoroastrians. Instead, like it was an omen, they noted their extraordinary big and long noses, Parthian, perhaps Pinocchio. Given the Persian Rashidun undertone, I dare to speculate that their Moshu hierarchy was established according to their family relationship. The next of, of Ken to the original king was to be the new ruler, perhaps a proto Mahdi. That is how the Marzutrans did it anyway. The presence of Caliph Umar in the Rashidun lineup requires that uh, Eliah Bar Kapsa, aka the Jewish exarch Huziel, was the original king and Muhammad. Without speculation, Es ibn Kapisa al Tay was Muhammad and also the Jewish exarch Huziel. The Rashidun got this one right. I'm just not sure they continue to want to. Um, I think AJ Jukes may have meant to write Huziel's son Nehemiah, whose reign may have ended in 617 rather than Huziel there, um, particularly considering what was said earlier. Particularly if you look here, um, this is when the Jewish Marzutran exilarch Nehemiah bin Huziel. So that's who he's referring to. So I think that's who he meant rather than Huziel. Okay, then we have the, the dates there. So that's it. We're going to leave it at that for today. There was a long video, a lot to take in. Um, uh, leave your comments below, particularly what you thought were the, the most significant points in this particularly long presentation. What, what three points do, did you take from this as being significant in terms of moving our understanding along? So thank you for watching and see you all very soon. Bye bye.